In the annals of Ethiopian and African history, one name stands out among the rest, Haile Selassie I, the 225th and final emperor of Ethiopia. From 1930 until his overthrow in 1974, he ruled the country and left an indelible mark on his destiny. This visionary leader brought Ethiopia onto the world stage. He steered the nation into the League of Nations and later the United Nations while making Addis Ababa the vibrant center for the Organization of African Unity, today known as the African Union. Ironically, Emperor Haile Selassie initiated the changes that led to his downfall, with examples being the military training program that exposed Ethiopian officers to representative institutions in the United States and the Haile Selassie I University, where students learned to think about political economy. As time went on, the emperor could not seem to adapt to new concepts and he lost touch with his subjects. On September 12, 1974, Ethiopia stood at a crossroads. Emperor Haile Selassie was deposed by the Coordinating Committee of the Armed Forces, Police and Territorial Army, known as the DERG. This Soviet-backed military junta would go on to govern Ethiopia for nearly two decades. In this episode of African Biographics, we delve deeper into the factors that precipitated the fall of a ruler who was once revered by millions. Born Tafari Makonen in 1892, Emperor Haile Selassie was an iconic figure of the 20th century. After a struggle for the throne in 1916, the young Selassie emerged first as regent, then as emperor of Ethiopia from 1930. Over the course of his rule, the emperor abolished slavery, introduced constitutional reform, and expanded access to education for the masses. Emperor Haile Selassie faced a major challenge when Italy invaded Ethiopia in the 1930s, forcing him to flee to England for five years. He returned to his homeland and led it through the Second World War. To the outside world, Haile Selassie was a progressive and respected leader who graced many red carpet events. But his court in Ethiopia began to see him as a feudal and outdated monarch who resisted change and ignored the growing discontent among his people. For Haile Selassie, sharing or even relinquishing power was out of the question and he was also reluctant to bring in reforms. In the latter days of his rule, the emperor controlled a compliant parliament that only served his agenda without addressing the real needs of his country. At the beginning of the 1970s, Ethiopia was still one of the most economically underdeveloped countries in the world. Haile Selassie's regime began to face widespread criticism for its failure to address pressing economic and political issues. These seeds of discontent set the stage for the coup of 1974 that toppled the emperor. One of the major reforms in the regime of Haile Selassie was in the education sector. His government even sent youth graduates from Ethiopia for further studies abroad, hoping to create a loyal and skilled elite. After the first attempted coup against him in the early 1960s, the emperor engineered the establishment of the Haile Selassie I University, a significant step towards higher education in Ethiopia. The emperor was confident that the educated youth would prioritize securing jobs rather than challenging the status quo. Now, over the next decade, the university students in particular, the very group Selassie had always fervently believed needed to have their education prioritized, began to actively move against their monarch. At the university, students engaged in revolutionary discussions, but they remained relatively restrained as Haile Selassie maintained his firm grip on power. However, Ethiopia soon became engulfed by student movements that increasingly embraced leftist and communist-style ideologies. For this new generation, Haile Selassie was no longer a figure to be admired, but a bourgeoisie bureaucrat to be deplored. The academic year 1969-1970 at the Haile Selassie I University campus became a focal point of political unrest. The university became a breeding ground for impassioned student protests as the students were determined to make their voices heard. In turn, the emperor reluctantly allowed the establishment of a student union and newspaper. It soon became apparent, however, that this newspaper would not toe the line of state-controlled media. Articles and poems surfaced, thinly veiling their criticism of the country and its leader. The student protests reached a boiling point in December 1969, when a student leader was killed, allegedly by the Imperial Security Services. This sparked a massive demonstration that turned violent, resulting in the deaths of 23 students. Emperor Selassie attempted to restore order by publicly dismissing the Minister of Education. 
Behind closed doors, however, his men employed brutal tactics to pacify the campus. While subsequent years did not witness similarly deadly events, the students continued their protests, enduring beatings, imprisonment, and interrogations. Their newspaper publication gave way to the more radical paper titled Struggle. Struggle openly criticized various aspects of Haile Selassie's regime, especially policies linked to the United States. Student protests would become a regular occurrence over the next few years, with demonstrators demanding more liberalization and modernization from what they increasingly viewed as an archaic regime. Emperor Haile Selassie would soon have even more pressing problems when Eritrea, the former Italian colony that had been incorporated into Ethiopia, began vying for its independence. In February of 1944, at a meeting with United States President Franklin D. Roosevelt, Haile Selassie submitted memoranda stressing the imperative for recovering Eritrea and thereby gaining free access to the sea. In 1948 and again in 1949, two commissions established by the wartime Allied powers and the United Nations reported that Eritrea lacked national consciousness and an economy that could sustain independence. The United States, wishing to secure a communications base in Asmara and naval facilities in Masawa and also to counter possible subversion in the region, supported Eritrea's federation with Ethiopia. This union took place in September of 1952. However, this arrangement only lasted until 1962. On this particular occasion, on November 14, 1962, Emperor Haile Selassie unilaterally dissolved the Federation and the Eritrean Parliament and annexed the country. This annexation marked the end of Eritrea's brief period of autonomy and integration into Ethiopia under Haile Selassie's rule. The forceful dissolution of their autonomy was carried out through intimidation and violence, a memory that remained etched in the minds of Eritreans. As a result, many Eritrean youth, primarily Muslims, sought refuge in Sudan and Egypt. In 1960, they had established the Eritrean Liberation Front, the ELF, which initiated an armed struggle within Eritrea in November of 1961. This movement carried out political and military activities in an attempt to gain independence. Within the next 10 years after its formation, the ELF posed a serious threat to Haile Selassie's empire. The impact of its existence was even felt beyond the boundaries of Ethiopia, especially when Ethiopian planes were subjected to subversive activities. This group's existence would also trigger a series of events that would lead to Haile Selassie's downfall and Ethiopia's transformation. One of the greatest paradoxes of the last few years of Selassie's reign was how he was largely admired outside of Ethiopia and yet increasingly held in contempt by large segments of his people. Despite the growing conflict in Eritrea, Emperor Selassie consistently attempted to portray himself as a man of peace. Nothing quite personified this as much as his presiding over the creation of the Organization of African Unity in 1963. This group would be headquartered in the Ethiopian capital of Addis Ababa. In May of 1963, Selassie himself would be made the very first chairperson of this organization. In a sad irony, he was a steadfast advocate of pan-African unity even when the unity of his citizens was often non-existent. While the emperor traveled from one country to another, enjoying international fame, Ethiopia lagged behind. His international stature and acclaim seemed to diminish his patience and connection with his people in Ethiopia. It would be an understatement to say that the emperor seemed to disconnect from his people, losing touch with their needs and aspirations. The list of Emperor Haile Selassie's international adventures and the array of famous personalities he encountered are too extensive to detail here. During tough economic downturns, some even went so far as to describe Emperor Haile Selassie as a wayward husband cheating on his country for the thrill of an international mistress. Exacerbating matters even further for the emperor was the terrible famine that struck northeastern Ethiopia in 1972 and 1973. By July of 1973, an estimated 1.8 million people in the four northern provinces of Tigray, Wolo, Northern Shore, and Bekmenda were affected by the drought, while huge losses of livestock were impoverishing the people of the region. By the end of 1973, the impact of the drought on the country's politics could no longer be ignored. 
Between 50,000 and 100,000 people in central Ethiopia had died. Massive aid was urgently required and even so, it would take several years to build up the cattle herds again. 13 refugee camps were established in Wolo province. Unfortunately, relief was hampered by the inaccessibility of the region. Following student protests in Addis Ababa, the government asked friendly countries for help, but its first appeals were low-key as it did not wish to admit to a major crisis. However, a great proportion of the medical and food supplies that were poured into the famine area by the government never reached their destinations. Instead, corrupt government administrators and their aides sold the relief supplies or kept them. The government did act quickly to deal with this issue and most of the profiteers were rounded up for trial. Foolishly, the government did not give the famine wide publicity and was accused of minimizing the facts. The Ministry of the Interior did want publicity, but the Ministry of Tourism did not, while the government was averse to publicizing the corruption that had been uncovered for fear of giving Ethiopia a bad name. In the end, the facts came out and did more harm than they needed to. British journalist Jonathan Dimbleby's revelation of the famine played a pivotal role in exposing the government's cover-up and undermining the emperor's rule. Emperor Haile Selassie also faced criticism for spending $35 million to celebrate his 80th birthday during the Wall of Famine. While the hungry peasants and nomads did not directly revolt against Haile Selassie, the famine issue resonated deeply among students, the middle class in Addis Ababa and the wider world. In 1973, the students learned of the widespread famine, which the government at the time was doing nothing about. The students boycotted classes to hold a meeting to discuss what could be done about the famine, but this meeting was violently broken up by riot police who beat students, employees, teachers and bystanders without discretion. By now, unrest seemed to have taken hold of all segments of Ethiopian society. In 1973, gas prices rose sharply due to the embargo that the organization of Arab petroleum exporting countries had placed on several countries in light of the Yom Kippur war. This led to several more protests, especially among taxi workers and similar driver-based professions who could no longer work due to the high gas prices. However, like many leaders out of touch with those under their charge, Haile Selassie never imagined that the protesters represented the true sentiment of the Ethiopian people. For him, it was merely a fringe group of radicals and nothing more. Yet the protest movement in Ethiopia would only continue to grow. A real problem came when the once loyal military began to protest as well, demanding an increase in their wages. On January 12, 1974, enlisted men at an army outpost in Negele, southern Ethiopia, mutinied against their senior officers in protest of poor food and a shortage of water. Their water pump had broken down. Now, when their seniors refused to allow them the use of their well, they were imprisoned. The mutineers then sent a petition to the emperor asking for their grievances to be remedied. Emperor Haile Selassie responded by sending an army general as his envoy to investigate the matter, but he too was detained. Despite the blatant insubordination of the soldiers, Selassie promised an improvement in the mutineers' conditions and decided against any punishment. The news of this mutiny spread to every army unit in the country. In Addis Ababa, rebel officers in the 4th Division took eight ministers hostage, demanding they be sacked for corruption. Once again, Haile Selassie responded with more concessions, sacking a bevy of senior officers and further increasing pay and allowances. Civil unrest also erupted in Addis Ababa in early 1974, and the following brief summary of events shows how Emperor Selassie's regime was irrevocably losing its grip on power. On Thursday, 21 February, several government employees failed to report to work due to transportation problems. Additionally, random shootings were reported. Two students were killed by soldiers guarding buses and installations and soldiers toting machine guns on open army trucks patrolling the streets. On Saturday, 23 February, Emperor Haile Selassie appeared on TV and radio announcing the suspension of a proposed new education policy as well as a reduction in oil prices. The following day, which was Sunday, 24 February, the streets of Addis Ababa were deserted. The government had arrested 1,000 taxi drivers who had demonstrated against high gas prices. 
The soldiers, now everywhere, were coordinating and not opposing stone-throwing students. More cars were smashed. On the evening news, it was announced that the salary of soldiers would be raised to $100 a month, comparable with the salaries of other civil service employees. This salary increase was effective the following month. On Monday, 25 February, there was a mass promotion of officers and some of the officers were taken to the palace to thank Emperor Selassie in person. The following day, early in the morning, it was reported that the ground forces in Asmara, the Eritrean capital, had mutinied. They took control of the radio station and broadcast demands for more pay and improved conditions of service. Some of the officers also demanded political changes and the dismissal of ministers and generals. The Asmara soldiers arrested all officers above the rank of captain. On Thursday, 28 February, troops were sent to guard important installations, including the Ministry of Information, the banks and the airport. At around 2 p.m., the emperor read a short speech announcing the appointment of a new prime minister. This was followed by an announcement of more salary increases. All of these developments showed that things were quickly falling apart in Ethiopia. The new prime minister appointed a new cabinet whose composition reflected an attempt to bridge the gap between the old and the new, between the emerging middle class and the retreating nobility. However, many people in Ethiopia felt that this move had come a year too late. As the situation went from bad to worse, people started talking about a shadowy coordinating committee of the military that was directing events and controlling or influencing the forces of change. The members of this shadowy coordinating committee, later known as the DERG, numbered around 120 and came from the rank and file and the junior officers up to the rank of captain of the entire military, the army, the police and even the militia, traditionally looked down upon by the military establishment. For many months the DERG had remained in the shadows. None of the names of its members were announced and its activities were kept hidden from the general public. With no organized political parties to challenge them, it was as if this revolution had landed in their lap. From February to September 1974, the Derg had began carrying out what is often referred to as a creeping coup d'etat. They steadily gained power and slowly started arresting and executing individuals associated with Haile Selassie's regime. The Derg's reasons for staging this creeping coup were grievances accumulated over the years, including a semi-feudal system, low salaries for the military, overtaxation, famines, and autocratic land seizures, which fueled nationwide protests. As members of the Derg expanded beyond the original leaders who had initiated the revolt, rivalry and competition for leadership caused the core body to reaffirm its power and elect an individual the leader saw as lacking a strong social base and therefore malleable as its chairman. Unfortunately, this move was a tragic mistake. Eventually, Mengis to Haile Mariam, an obscure man with the rank of captain who had a reputation for drunken brawling, emerged as the leader of the Derg. Mengis to Haile Mariam turned out to be what no one had anticipated, an ambitious man determined to ascend to the summit of power. The Derg moved cautiously at first, as it was unsure of how much resistance it would encounter from the emperor, the aristocracy and loyal units of the armed forces. But stage by stage, as it grew in confidence, the Derg began to dismantle the whole imperial structure. During July and August of 1974, it issued long lists of names of palace functionaries, high government officials, and prominent aristocrats, including the emperor's closest advisors, calling on them to give themselves up or face confiscation of their assets. Most of them surrendered voluntarily, but some were arrested by force. Hundreds of them were incarcerated in the basements of buildings in the Grand Palace. Emperor Haile Selassie was left at the Jubilee Palace with only a handful of personal servants. The Derg turned next to the Emperor himself. In the government press, on the radio, and on the television, a barrage of attacks were unleashed on his regime, condemning it for corruption and exploitation. Emperor Selassie was accused of squandering the country's meager resources on expensive trips abroad and of being willfully negligent over the wall of famine. The Derg had hostile propaganda demystifying the emperor, including showing a film of him feeding cows at a time when people were dying during the wall of famine. 
On 25 August 1974, the Jubilee Palace was nationalized and renamed the National Palace. Sadly, there was to be no dignified exit for Emperor Ali Selassie and his relatives. At a four-day secret meeting in early September, the Derg voted to dethrone Haile Selassie. On 11 September, nine princesses, including the Emperor's sole surviving daughter and seven granddaughters, were imprisoned in a dungeon-like cell, their heads shaved and allowed only two mattresses to share between them. On the same day, officers from the Derg interrogated Haile Selassie on the whereabouts of the fortune that he had amassed over the years, but he vehemently denied possessing any fortune. On September 12, 1974, six months after the revolution broke out, the Derg announced the overthrow of Emperor Haile Selassie's regime and his replacement by a constitutional monarchy. The emperor's ailing son, Crown Prince Asfar Osen, was named monarch. He however rejected this proclamation, referring to it as illegitimate. The creeping coup had come to an end. Emperor Haile Selassie was pushed off the stage of history, which he had dominated for over half a century. All hopes of establishing a civilian democratic system after the end of his rule were dashed when the Derg established a military government. News that the Emperor had been deposed had been broadcast on radio early that morning. Addis Ababa was crowded with joyous celebrations. As the Emperor was taken in a Volkswagen Beetle to his place of detention, the crowd shouted words of abuse. In March of 1975, the Derg officially abolished the Ethiopian monarchy, thereby putting an end to a dynasty that had spanned thousands of years. Meanwhile, Emperor Haile Selassie I is said to have remained in detention for some months before he was taken to the old palace where he died one year after his overthrow. The manner of his death is shrouded in mystery. One tale has it that he was quietly murdered by Mengistu and secretly buried underneath the office from which Mengistu would rule Ethiopia for 17 years. But the fact is that Emperor Haile Selassie I died a lonely death with few to mourn him. Most of his relatives were either dead, exiled or in detention and his ministers and the palace hangers on were either detained or had dispersed. The fall of Emperor Haile Selassie marked a turning point in Ethiopian history shaped by grievances, revolutions and the rise of the Derg. Don't forget to like and share the video if you enjoyed it. Thank you all for tuning in. This has been Tatenda for African Biographics. Until next time, cheers. Have a good one.